Welcome to Launch Code, a premier business podcast, starring Evan Hafer, Matt Best, and Jared Taylor. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Launch Code. I'm your host today. Co-host is Logan Stark, and we have an awesome guest in town, Jeremiah Doty, uh, who some of you will know from social media as Field to Plate. Yes, sir. And uh, he's been on the road for 16, 17 straight hours, driving from Orange County here to San Antonio. Popped him in the chair right away, but it was the like, season. Sit back Talk down. Sit back down. I was like, damn, I've been sitting for 18 hours. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted, before we, any, before we even talked or asked any questions, like, let's just start recording so we can get everything fresh and not staged or rehearsed. So, all right, man. So you're in. You live in Orange County, and yep. you are here in Texas for what reason? Uh, I teach from field to plate classes, so I take new and existing hunters into kind of a whirlwind three day course on how to how to shoot a gun properly, how to handle it, and then shoot a doe, skin that doe, gut that doe, butcher that doe down 100, uh, percent and then do two cooking classes. So three days of just hands-on intense training on how to properly do it and not watch some hillbilly on youtube just butcher a deer like actually get hands dirty for your meal so it's kind of a fun experience so it's like cradle to the grave the whole process 100 percent, yeah. yeah like i don't allow gloves like they're like oh my hands get dirty i said didn't get dirty like I'll, I'll sit there with mud and blood run it all over you and say just get in there and do it like, so all the people going through this are butchering the animals that they killed themselves yep, yep. That's so great. yeah so i i will shoot an animal myself each class and then i teach them how to break it down and they are hands-on from the moment you know they're cutting out the butthole to the moment they're putting it on the plate so it's a cool th- it's a cool experience to watch you know i had a bunch of women last year and they were like this is disgusting at the end they were like more in depth in the animal than the guys were I was really like, that was cool that's awesome how long have you been doing that uh i started it last year uh, and i had 26 people go through but then i did uh, 163 people total throughout the year in different states and with youth in California, youth in Texas, youth in Wyoming. So that's awesome. So how'd you get, how, how'd you get into that? Like how, like, I remember the first flyer I saw online. I think that's when we met cause we started talking. I was right. like, dude, what, what is this, man? This is amazing. Uh, it all started eight years ago uh, when I went out and hunted my first big game animal. And I literally went out there with a Swiss army knife and tried to gut this antelope in the middle of Wyoming with a pocket knife and just it sucked and there was no one really there to teach me and so I went and watched YouTube videos and like I said it was just it was 35 minutes of some hillbilly hanging it up that I couldn't understand draw and it wasn't hands-on and so I struggled for years trying to do it myself and I said there's got to be a better way there's got to be a hands-on way to teach people how to do this and so I went and sat and watched butchers butcher pigs and cows and I said, hey, can I get hands-on with you? And this old guy's hand me a knife said, cut up that pig. And so I learned hands-on. And so I said, I got to teach people how to do this and take them through a whole course and not just say, hey, come out and watch me do it. Like there's a lot of Cabela's and Bass Pro. They'll, hey, come watch us butcher a goat. And they've got that half beautiful goat and everyone sits in the audience and and sees this goat. And it's like, they're it's not, not going to really remember something you can learn visually. I no, like. I think you, you have to shove your hand deep inside the muscle right. to understand that that muscle sits and where it sits and where the fascia sits and where the bone sits. And you can't just sit there and be like, oh, that's awesome. And then go home and be like, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And then more importantly that you can't eat, you, you can, but you shouldn't eat fascia. Right. Oh, it's, oh. it's very, that's the silver skin. I mean, that's, that's where my dog's eating. Yeah. Like chewing on for an hour. Yeah. Um, no, that's funny. I, uh, when I moved down here, I had some elk meat and we cooked it up and the fascia is all the stuff I cut off. And I was like, well, let's chop this up and feed it to your dog. You know, humans don't eat it. Dogs love it. Right. Not not humans. I mean, you can sit there and chew on it, but yeah, you'll be spitting in a napkin in about 20 minutes. So. Right. <laughs> Get all the meat off of it. So um, so how long have you been hunting? Uh, been bird hunting my whole life. Right. Since I was six. Uh, big game, officially seven years now. Yeah. So. What was your first big game animal? Uh, Wyoming antelope. That antelope? Yeah, I was, I was a bird hunter, and then I, I, I'm allergic to beef. So eight years ago, I found out that I can't digest bovine fat. My body rejects it. And so like a good ribeye steak, it's like, nope, sorry, you can't have that. And an out burger. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Very unfortunate. Um, but it actually thrust me into big game. Like I was, I'm a meat and potatoes guy. Born, you know, I'm an Irish kid. And 
So I was like, I'm done with turkey. I'm done with chicken. I'm done with pork. Like I need red meat. And so that's where it kind of thrust me into this. And I was at the bow archery range getting ready for fall turkey season. And this old timer pulled out his bow. I was like, oh man, do you hunt? Because in Southern California, if someone pulls out a, a camouflage bow, it's either he's rich and just wants to shoot a Matthews or he, he hunts. He goes, oh, and I hunt. So him and I connected immediately and started talking. And he's like, I'm going to Wyoming. And I was like, I wish I could afford it. And he goes, dude, it's 38 bucks for a doe tag and license. I put my bow back in my case, drove home, bought a, bought a tag, and drove to Wyoming that weekend. Um, oh, that's awesome. And, you know, it was the hardest five, six days of my life. What day did you kill on? What did I kill it? What day? Uh, day five. Yeah. <laughs> day five. I mean, and it was it was one of those deals where I was pretty much just about to throw my rifle in the... I mean, I, I went out and bought a cheap rifle, put a Walmart Bushnell scope on it. I had no idea what I was doing. And then went out there and just... Finally, finally got it done, and then the animal's laying in the ground, and I'm like, "Okay, now what?" Yeah, yeah the work starts. Yeah, and the unknown. Yeah, and so that was my big game animal, and I got home, and I hated the meat, and I kind of was like, "I got to figure out how to do this better." And that's where from field to plate started. It was like, "How can I teach people to not jack up like I jacked up?" Right. Now, when I know that you guys are really heavy into the content game, and that's a big part of what you do. When when did that become a, a staple for? for you as a company and or have you been doing that from the get-go no i really i kind of just it all started with me just throwing out pictures on my instagram and just posting pictures and people like oh that looks good and i'm like really it's just me i mean i worked in restaurants my whole life as management but never ever thought about cooking um i liked cooking loved cooking but not ever thought of it as a career and people started asking for recipes and i'm like really it's just teriyaki antelope like it's a homemade teriyaki sauce it's not that hard and it just evolved from there so three years ago i tore my calf muscle and i couldn't go to work for six months and it was one of those deals where i was bored at home sitting on the couch and i was like i'm just going to focus on from field to plate and for six months i just dove in head first and watched my social media you know go from like two thousand followers to like nine thousand followers in six months i was like okay there's something to this and so i quit my job making good money as restaurant management and and corporate job and looked at my wife said hey i'm gonna do this she said go for it and i just started hunting 100 percent and understanding what flavor profiles and meat was and how animals behave and what they taste like and now i eat a lot of cool animals yeah i do want to say that we're having this podcast on national vegan day oh well is that why <laughs> i had appropriate is that why i had like 112 death threats today <laughs> that really Maybe is that. appropriate i didn't even yeah. think about that. that's fantastic well grab a piece of meat and throw it at a vegan yeah, yeah. But um, so what other animals like you've obviously whitetail antelope? What else have you hunted? Uh, I've hunted. Let's see. Besides like all your all your bird species, um, Neil Guy access down here in Texas, of course. Those are just beautiful, delicious animals. Uh, elk, mule deer, uh, black tailed deer, white tailed deer, coos deer, uh, wild boar. In every state that I can shoot those those pigs, I try to shoot them because they're just everywhere. And uh, black bear in Alberta, Canada. Did you eat the bear? I love bear. bear oh, yeah? Bear meat is probably my top five. Really? What yeah. are your top five? Let's hear that. Uh, you got elk. You got access. Um, you have w- Texas whitetail. I just, I, I understand why people want to shoot whitetail. Uh, high mountain muleys and then black bear. Like spring black bear, not fall black bear. It's interesting you say high mountain muleys. Why is Because the ones that you get out on the on the flats, yeah, in the plains, eating all the sage. Yeah, it tastes like a sagebrush. Yeah, it's like sucking on a plane. Yeah, yeah, and not a fan. No, the only one surprising in there is Texas whitetail. I've been, I've been here for like six months, but I didn't, I haven't been privy to the the deliciousness of Texas whitetail. After you suck on a sagebrush mule deer, yeah. and you come down and eat a corn fed, protein fed whitetail, then you'll understand why whitetail's on the top. It's just, it's just a pure, delicious flavorful meat that the kids just go crazy for and it just doesn't have any of that wild taste like you're getting in elk and mule deer and coos deer and stuff like that i was in a bear camp a couple years ago four or five years ago and um they had a mule deer roast from like from idaho not in the mountains like that on the flats and uh high plains desert muley and um everything about it was perfect except the taste right like it looked wonderful the brown sauce was perfect the meat the striations you could literally cut it with a spoon i was like god this is gonna be so good put a bite in my mouth and i was like god damn it man it's 
tastes like shit. It tastes like you're sucking on sagebrush. And that's what yeah. I tell everybody, too. It's like, and like a lot of guys don't like antelope. Depending on where you harvest your antelope, depends on if you like antelope or not. Like if you're shooting it down like in Evanston and Rawlings and that's where it's just flat sagebrush as far as you can see, it tastes like a sagebrush. If you're shooting it up by like Buffalo or Casper where it's rolling grass hills, they're, they're amazing. Yeah. Or Montana, like Montana antelope is just to die for. The one the one wild game animal that, that I've probably shot more of than anything is ducks. And duck gets a bad reputation. People 100%. are like, oh, my God, it tastes like shit. It's like, what are you talking about? Duck is delicious. Like, it's absolutely splendid. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, and I, I mean, I was just talking to my co-pilot, you know, Gerard on the way up, and I said, don't blame the duck, blame the cook, because you, you don't know how to cook that duck. You right. don't know, understand it. And a lot of times guys are out there shooting spoonies and, yeah, you know. divers and, and stuff. And diver ducks, and then they're trying, to, they're trying to pluck it and roast it, and it's like, dude, you're eating mud. Yeah. You know, but you're shooting a, a mallard or an early season teal, uh, and it's just, gosh, just melt in your mouth. You know, smoke that sucker up, grill that up, fry it up, do whatever you want, but just don't wrap it in bacon. Like, just enjoy the flavor of the duck. Yeah. So, I mean, you've cooked a fair amount of duck that I've brought and stuff, and you, you know, we just cook it in the, on the, in the uh, cast iron around right the stove. Right. Butter, it's delicious. It's divine. Um, I think my favorite duck's probably teal. Right. I love teal. I mean, on, on all teal, your green wing, your blue wing, and your cinnamon—they're all just insanely delicious yeah and they're so small that it's like you know three little ducks is like a perfect meal so right no I, i'm a huge fan of that wild turkey another really good one so what's your go-to as far as like are you a cast iron guy or are you a smoker guy or are you or i don't know if you if you had to choose one and kind of your go-to there i think it depends on who's eating with me yeah like my wife and kids love it off the pellet smoker yep. like if they're not home and it's just me it's like Cast iron, butter, a little bit of olive oil, rosemary, thyme with like a squirt of orange, like just medium rare. And that's like, that's how I'll eat a duck breast. But the girls are there. They like it, you know, they like it all flavorful with the orange glaze and the, the smokiness of the pellet smoker. And it's, so I think you, it all depends on who's there. But for me, man, I love just a hot cast iron sear on almost all of my food. Yeah. We cooked a bunch of elk like that one night. We got, we, it, we probably had, it was like four or five people over at Logan's house. And like, I had just gotten down here and like unloaded a ton of elk. And I think we sat up for probably four or five hours, like just shooting the breeze, watching videos and just literally Logan sat over his stove and cooked elk steaks for like all, an hour. all, no dude, it was longer than that. Like that, that pan when you were done was so seasoned and it just, I mean, oh dude, it was unbelievable, man. Had like a three inch crust on the bottom oh, of it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Each one was better than the last. And yeah. so you just wanted to keep cooking and keep eating. And yeah. it just became like, have a little bit of this one and then it's, in the fridge. Then it's like, well, we only got like 15 steaks left. Might as well cook them all, man. Yeah. What the heck? Yeah. So what's your favorite hunting though? Favorite hunting is, is duck hunting. Yeah. Uh, or turkey hunting. Anytime that you can sit with another, you know, fellow hunter and just talk and enjoy it. Like duck hunting, I love that you don't got to be quiet. The yeah, same here, man. Like you're sitting there yes, sir. laughing hysterically and all of a sudden you just hear that faint. And like everybody shuts up, everybody looks, everybody grabs a, you know, a call to their mouth and everyone starts rapping the stupidest duck calls. You know, it doesn't sound like a duck. Not at all. And, and the duck knows that too. Oh yeah. The duck's like, I'm not going over there. And then that one, you know, duck's like, oh, I'm going to go. And they all follow him. And I think that's to me is just like the joy of like sitting there and watching all the dudes just stand up and just start just dumping at these ducks. I've done that. Watching the dogs hit the water, yeah. watching you know that sound when a duck, you know, hits the that hits smack. The oh, yeah. Just, um, I mean, like there's all those guys that'll challenge me like sitting in a deer stand for a deer, but I don't know duck blinds and listening to turkeys gobble in the morning just go crazy. Dude, I took the the greatest turkey hunt that I've ever been on was the first time I ever took Logan. And this was two, three years ago. You know how, like, everyone that's... I've been turkey hunting a long time. It's, yeah. it's one of my favorites. And you know, like, that, you're like, man, I sure hope it works out this way today. You know, the whole flock rolls in early season, like, for opening weekend. Right. All the gobblers are there. All the hens are there. The decoys are getting attacked by the hens. The, the Jake decoys are getting attacked by the gobblers. There was 25 turkeys in front of us that morning. Going to town. Just going crazy. It was amazing. It was phenomenal. Like, you hear them gobbling and stuff, and they're gobbling right in your face. Man, I, you just can't beat it. And you don't even pick up the gun at that point. You're just, like, enjoying the show. And that's, like, you know, 
we had we we hunted um, Missouri late season Missouri with NWTF this year, and we all sat there. And I remember it was foggy morning, and the trees just erupted. Just the cackle started, and then it was just gobble 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 gobble, gobble every tree. And our guns are on our laps, and we're watching the fog. And it was like you know in Top Gun when like they go through the clouds and like the swirl. That's what was happening with their feathers and their wings as they're landing. And we watched them come in. We watched them attack. And finally, like, the camera guy goes, are you going to shoot one of those? I was like, oh, my gosh, yeah, we're here to hunt turkeys. We're not just here to watch it. And it was just, you know, 30 minutes of just watching these birds be birds and not know we're there. And it just, it's just beautiful to see nature be nature, you know? Well, that's because they don't have a sense of smell. Right. If turkeys had a sense of smell, we would never see them. Oh, yeah, We'd especially with all them. the beans you eat in turkey camp. Uh, it's just. Yeah. It's one thing to read about the animal kingdom in a book. But you get to see it, and you get to see the interactions between different species like mm-hmm. that. It's it's super interesting. Like when we were in Africa, just watching the different animals around the watering hole. It's it's probably the best part of being there. And yeah, you, you see know. a hierarchy establish itself. Yep. You know, around the water hole and stuff. Oh yeah. But it's funny, you know, we we're sitting there and uh, those birds with Logan, and like he had a shotgun, I had my bow, and. Uh, I was like, all right, man, you ready? He's like, yeah. He's like, I'm going to get shoot one. I was like, all right, man, cool. I said, hold on a second, man, give me that shotgun. He's like, what? I was like, here, just use the bow. Because they're and, so close. Oh, um, so. he, he shot it. He shot one at like six feet, seven, eight feet. I mean, it was, it was nuts. It was bananas. Man. They're fairly resilient animals, too. They are. They're quite <laughs> yeah. resilient. They'll take a broadhead and run. Like, yeah, well, that's the thing. With, with turkeys, you have to take a, everyone's like, oh, take a wing. No, you got to take a leg. Because yeah. if you don't take a leg, they can, they'll run and take off. Right. You, you, know? I mean, you can pin both wings and they'll take off running. And turkeys run 30 miles an hour. Yeah. Like, you, try to, you try to catch up one, and it's hilarious watching a fat guy run after a turkey. Mm-mm. No. I'm not calling you fat, but. No, I quit messing with the, with the turkeys with the, with the bow. I just started shooting with a shotgun. Now. Right. You know, I've shot several with a bow. It's like, yeah, I'm just going to roll them up with a shotgun. Yeah, I mean, shoot it and be done with it. Yeah. Especially if you just shoot the head, you're not worried about pellets in the body. No, nope. and you no. do more damage to like the body with a bow than you ever would a shotgun. Oh, you can rip right through both breasts. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so eight years doing the field of plate thing, it's fairly you know it's it's got a Boy Scout esque uh, mentality and and ethos to it. What have been some of your keys to success as far as making this? This is your primary thing, right? Yeah, this is all I this is all I yeah. do now. So was it right off the bat it was super successful or was there lear- some learning curves in there? No, I think there was learning curves in just like everything you do. And I kind of looked at it from the fact of like I want to be different than everyone else in the industry. Like everyone in the industry is so cookie cutter and so I want to be famous on TV. I want to be the best. I want And I looked at it from a different aspect like I want to teach you to be the best. I want to teach, you know, like I have a girl coming to the class this session, it's her and her husband. And she has a really bad experience with hunting. Like her dad, when she was nine, made her go out and shoot a squirrel. Like made her shoot a squirrel. And it like scarred her for life. And she reached out and said, I really want to come to your class, but I don't want to shoot anything. But I want to learn the butchering aspect. Like my husband's a hunter and we want to come as a couple. And I said, more power to you, man. Like she's like, you're not going to be mad. I go, no, I'm going to sit in the blind with you and watch your husband shoot an animal. And I'm going to encourage you. And I'm going to show you that it's not the way your dad hunted. It's not the way they forced you to do it, but this is the way we, we respect this animal. And we, and I mean, she's texting me nonstop. She is so excited, and I'm trying to get her to, you know, I told her, I said, hey, if you want to shoot an animal, like, I'll personally buy your $312 out-of-state license. Like, if it comes down to it, you watch the class, you watch your husband, like, I'm going to pay for you to shoot that deer. And she's like, well, no. I was like, no, because I'm going to show you that, that we're different. You know, I took out, I took out last year, I took, actually this year and last year, I took out five ex-vegans now for their first hunt and it's the coolest experience for people that are giving me death threats six months ago and now they're in the field eating their first bite of meat in 21 years because of respect and that's where i think my approach is different is i'm not going to come at you and bash you over the head with i'm better than you i only shoot archery i only shoot a rifle i only do this i only drink this i only like i'm doing it because i want to teach you and watch you grow and you know that's super interesting. How did you get those people to get to that point? Or was that like a one-on-one conversation where it's like, hey, if you really want to have this argument with me, why don't you come out to one of my classes? Or Yeah, it, it started out, I mean, one of the, a lot of the people, it started out as very disrespectful death threats. On my, I mean, I get on average 50 to 100 death threats a day. Are these like detailed death threats? Oh, like, like they're going into how they're going to do oh, it? Oh, yeah, like debowelment. And I'm going to hang you like you hang your deer and let your gut smack you in the face like you let your... 
I'm like, well, I don't know what you're Googling. That's but excessive. I don't know what you're Googling, but I've never let the gut smack a deer in the face. <laughs> um, and so, and then I, I tell him, I said, hey, either you want to you come at me with respect because I'm going to come at you with respect, or you can get out of the conversation. But I'm not going to block you. I'm not going to give in to your rage. And then they'll direct message me and they'll go off. And so a lot of those, I just keep talking to them and I keep explaining to them. And they talk about conservation and I laugh. I go, how much money has PETA given to conservation last year? Zero dollars. How much has hunters given? Billions of dollars to conservation. And I start just laying out knowledge to them. And they're like, well, maybe like, okay, I see. And I see why you're doing it. And I tell them, I said, hey, I'm an animal lover, man. And like, if I see a deer caught in a fence, I'm not going to go shoot in the face. I'm going to get it out of the fence. Yeah. And I think that's a big misconception. I think that a lot of people, they they think, oh, you know, what would you do? It's like, well, I'd stop what I was doing. I'd go save that animal, cut it loose. Yeah. And like, well, you wouldn't want to shoot. Like, no, that's not hunting. Right. Like, I don't, I'm a hunter. I'm not, a, you know, I don't, I'm not a murderer. For, fancy myself as a killer. You know, right. it's like, oh, you know. If you now, if it was in like fair chase, and I was out pursuing that animal, and it was you know in the field, but I've never, never in a million years, uh, I'd burn a hunt and a tag just strictly to save an animal. Oh, we uh, I had I, we had an elk tag, and we saw this elk that had been shot with archery, and the whole entire shoulder was just oozing pus, and it was just, it was the most disgusting thing. And I looked at my buddy, I said, we can't eat any of that meat, and he goes, Are you think what I'm thinking? And he pulled out his rifle and he shot it, and we tagged that that little spiky, you know, elk, you know, he burned his $800 tag because we took that animal out of suffering and we couldn't, we, we salvaged, I think like one back ham that wasn't infected with this, you know, and we, it was, wasn't even a question in either of our minds to sp- spend that money to save that animal right. from its pain and stuff. And so the vegan back to the vegan thing is just one of those deals where it's like, let's just do it. And so I took out a dude dove hunting, um, a guy local by us and, kept reaching out and he's like dude i think i want to go on a dove hunt i'm like what like okay he's i think i want to go on it i think i want to eat it i think he had a similar story he grew up in texas and they were out for a birthday party when he was like 10 and his friends went out and just like annihilated a deer and just disrespected this deer and did horrible things to this deer just because it was funny for this 10th birthday party and that turned him into veganism like he's like i can't eat meat i can't watch the suffering and so for 21 years of his life, he hasn't touched meat. But then he saw my page and saw how I respect the animals and saw what I do with it and that I use. I mean, I even take the esophagus and make dog chews out of it. Like I use every ounce of that animal that I can because it gave his life. And so he went through hunter safety class. He went out and bought a Remington 870. So he's like, what's the best gun? I said, this is the, just go buy this gun. I've got, I've got one. I've got four. And I go, just buy it. If you don't want to buy it, borrow one of mine. And we went out there, and, you know, he's covered in tattoos, and he's a little skinny little thing. And we go out in the field, and doves start flying over. And, you know, I'm shooting, and he's just standing watching. And finally, this bird flies right down his throat, and he takes a shot, hits the ground, rolls kind of, you know, a little bit in front of him, and he just stands there. And he's looking, and I put my gun, I unload my gun. I put my gun down. I walk over to him. I said, are you doing okay? He goes, I don't know. I was like, all right, well, let's just take a second. And I unloaded his gun and walked over and grabbed that dove. And it felt like I was talking to like a four-year-old. But we worked him through it. And finally, he puts it in his bag. He's like, all right, let's do this. And he limited out and we shot it. And we went back to camp and I shot him how to, you know, showed him how to gut it, how to pluck it, how to skin it, all the different methods. And that night I said, what do you want to eat? And he's like, I want to smoke it. And so we smoked it and we, I got it on film where he sat there and took a bite. And he's like, this is good. This is, and now his wife, who's a vegan, is talking about like, hey, why don't you go out and shoot an elk? Why don't you go out and shoot a deer? Like, and so I, you know, I'm, I dropped off antelope meat, and I was like, if you like this, next year I'm taking you antelope hunting. Like, and so it's just a cool thing to see people understanding that we're not mindless hillbillies out riding trucks, shooting everything that walks, but we're actually doing it for a cleaner meat. Like, I know every aspect of that where that animal lived, how it died, whose hands and machines it touched. Like, go to the, you know, go to H E B and get a steak, and tell me about that animal. You can't. Yeah. Like, it's funny you mentioned you mentioned the childhood stories. So, like Tim Ferriss was very much anti hunter until because he grew up in a, a small. I think I'm pretty sure it's a small town in in like uh, New York, right? Where you know they have the urban deer complex and stuff. And he said you know he'd see deer running through their yard with arrows in them and whatnot, which um, is unfortunate. But uh, I think Stephen Ranella, he went hunting with Stephen Ranella and like kind of fell in love with it. You know. Right. So yeah, there's you know there's all kinds of stuff like you know things happen to people in their childhood that 
can ha- give them like a, a, a skewed uh, opinion or, or, or optic on, on something. Right. And then they need to experience it as an adult to really understand. Right. And experience yeah. the right way. Like there's so many guys out there that are doing it the wrong way. I mean, last year at the, at the ranch during the classes, we had poachers come in and try to poach. And it's like, it was a great learning experience for the five people at the class. Like, this is why we do what we do. This is, these people are negative. These are the, these are what are hurting our industry. Right. And these dudes are all in their freaking Sitka gear. They're all, you know, it's like, you know, they were going to shoot that buck and take it back and take pictures and, and pose in social media. And it's like, again, getting away from yourself and thinking about the actual industry itself and how can we better the industry and how can we stop fighting with each other? I mean, that's the biggest deal. Like we're destroying our industry from the inside out and we're giving the vegans and the, the hate we're giving them ammo. Oh yeah. That drives me crazy. Well, there is, <clears throat> it's easy to uh, want to take up arms against some of the things that's happening with food, with like mass production of, of chicken and beef. And you see all these videos that they're posting of, you know, these <clears throat> containers that are fields and acres and acres long. And you see cattle upon cattle that's just stuck in these cells. Right. And, then, and then, you know, the chicken farms. And I think, coming after hunters is a it's an easy low-hanging fruit target when because they can't go after the big business it's a target with a face on it right right but but it's actually the hunters that are doing it right so i'm i'm super happy to hear that you're you're getting some of these people in your classes and and kind of working them through this and it's it's one thing it's like yeah we need to just kind of open up to perspective and try new things and it's it's not going to hurt anybody to right. to see where this is and i think just kind of the you know it's kind of not really in our nature to want to go stick our fingers in guts and and watch the blood and and do all this but um i always go back to you know like well what if it all fails you know i'm i'm a marine so like it's always relying on the fundamental parts of life and and if it all went bad and everything went away like how are you going to survive right and that's how you're going to do it i mean i live in like i said i live in orange county right so i call that the anti-hunting mecca of the world yeah it really is um and my daughters i have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old she just turned five and it's amazing to see my daughters in their classes and in their their life because all they eat is wild game like we don't buy meat at the grocery store like i even we make lunch meat out of like deer and turkey and everything and to hear them go to school and talk about what they're eating and to watch their friends cringe or to invite their friends over and have a deer steak. And my, my four-year-old, I came home from turkey season, and she comes running out, and she rips open the cooler and starts just bawling uncontrollably. I was like, oh, my gosh. She's, Daddy, I don't love you. And she ran upstairs. I was like, oh, great. Like, she's mad I killed. Like, she's never been mad. She always, like, loves hunting. So my wife comes down and goes, you might want to go talk to her. So I walked upstairs, and I go, you know, June, what's wrong? She goes, you plucked it without me. <laughs> and it was this. That's good. It was, a, it was a dad moment. I'm like, oh, but I saved you all the feathers. She's like, you saved all the feathers? Okay. And she ran downstairs. She started playing with the feathers and making jewelry. And But they go to their classes. And my, my oldest daughter, her teacher goes, hey, so we're studying um, turkeys and stuff for Thanksgiving. Your daughter said that you can bring in feathers and beards and feet. And, and each kid can have a, a wing. And I was like, yeah, if you want. She's like what you have all that and I go I got boxes of like turkey feathers and wings and tails and and so it's kind of a cool thing to see my daughters changing the perception of what hunters are in Orange County being two cute little blonde haired girls and they're just like hey this is what we do like my daughter went to a birthday party and they had fillets and the mom calls me and goes your daughter says she doesn't eat cows like what's wrong with her is she vegetarian is she I go no, she, and I go ask her what she eats. And she's like, I eat buffalo, elk, bite, you know, like goes through the whole list. And she's like, I don't have any of that. And she goes, oh, then I'll just have salad. Like my daughters are understanding that there's a better way to do it. There's a right. cleaner way to eat meat. And I mean, they're eight years old. If we can change an eight-year-old's mind about what's real food is, why can't we change an adult man or adult right. woman about what real food is? I mean, I, I think there's people, you know, if you look at social media, for example, like I, I think there's – way fewer anti-hunters than we think it's just the ones that are vocal on social media are are extremely vocal like you know you're talking about like you're getting death threats and stuff when i go to africa i go to africa every summer and i get i I bet you i've blocked three thousand people on twitter right like i mean i get some of the craziest messages like insane stuff and uh like i don't know if you recall the girl that was hunting a few years ago and 
shot that giraffe. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were standing right beside her. She used my rifle. Yeah. That was a, that was a beautiful giraffe, by the way. Well, but, but that's an interesting thing. So giraffes have a very specific food source. Right. And that the property, the, 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 the ranch we were on, um, the carrying capacity was like, I think it was like nine giraffes. They had 19, something like that. And you could tell. So if you look at that giraffe and you look at the spots on him, they're right. very faded. Right. Compared to a giraffe that's in a population that's extremely healthy and well-balanced, those spots are much darker. So, you know, I get it. You love giraffes, anthropomorphism, and calendars, and stuffed animals, and I get it. But, like, don't just attack someone when, one, you have no clue how that system right. works. Two, you've never been to Africa. You know, three, you don't, you don't contribute anything to the conversation or the cause other than cussing at someone on Twitter. You know, that's right. just stupid. Like, you got to be a part, either part of the problem or part of the solution. And I think that's one of the things, like, with the food and the education and all that stuff, it's like, I mean, I get messages all the time, like, why do you have to go kill your kill that? Why don't you go get your food like everyone else does from the grocery store? And it's all like, the time. do you read that out loud to yourself in the mirror? And then if you want me to answer it, let me know, and I'll think right. about it. But it's just kind of nutty, man. So do you even buy uh, meat from the store anymore? Uh-uh. Not, it's, uh, it's not, you're 100%. Yeah, not three years. I mean, there'll be a random occasions we have parties, and I'll buy, like, a whole chicken to throw it in the smoker for people that, like – are very anti, like, I'm not eating anything you make. And it's like, gamey. Yeah, I hate that word. <laughs> that word needs to get out of the, out of the verbal <laughs> The gamey, th- that's just strictly from the, how the animals, basically, from the time it dies until it gets on a plate, like, what happens. Like, the gaminess, you can control that. Uh, yeah, it, the gamey, wild aspect. I think we talked about earlier, it's what they're eating primarily, mm-hmm. and then how you process them with what they're eating with the blood and the, I mean, people tell me all the time, well, that animal ran. So it has, you know, I'm like, no, that doesn't affect it at all. It's, I mean, you can literally take that and you can let that animal rest and those muscles are going to retract. They're going to relax. The problem is, is that when they're running, all the blood is flowing to those muscles and the blood is where the negative flavor is coming in from. Mm. And again, if you're letting it, like we, we went antelope hunting and we all shot our antelopes. It's like 80 degrees outside this, I mean, in October 1st in where we were hunting antelope. And we get our, you know, antelope back on ice. I mean, ASAP. We drive into town to get food, and in the back of a car in 80 degrees are two big old bucks sitting there. And we walk in. I'm like, whose bucks are in the truck? Oh, they're ours. We shot them like two hours ago. And this, and I go, they're like, oh, we don't like antelope meat anyway. I was like, you don't like it because it's sitting in your truck in 80 degree <laughs> weather for three hours. Like, hasn't been gutted. Yeah, still has like, fur on it. Yeah, that's why you don't like it. The like, internal temperature is actually hotter now than it was gosh, when yeah, it was it's alive. Probably 100. 30 degrees yeah and it's like but again their perception is i don't like it so it doesn't really matter same with like duck hunters like we talked about i'll go out and hunt with ducks with guys and they'll be like well here here's my ducks i don't like them every time i go D- try it well give me a recipe and that's kind of where like another reason for field to play started was because people like go give me a recipe all right fine cook it yeah you know and it's and it's that's where it looks at and like people like I mean, even with you guys, like, doing coffee and stuff, like, when I got reached out, they're like, well, can you make a coffee recipe for gravy? I was like, yeah, totally. And it's like, well, no, and, you know, and people are like, well, we don't make it with coffee. I'm like, well, then figure it out. Like, use your tongue, use your mind, and figure out how to make something taste good. Like, don't be scared of it. Like, I mean, you, you drink a nasty LaCroix that tastes like, you know, fruit peed in water. Why can't you drink coffee gravy, you know? Yeah, I'm drinking one right now. Oh, so, I didn't even notice you were drinking one. What's your it. process as far as... uh you know, recipe development and then, and then kind of working that into content as far as like, is it primary like video? Or are you trying to kick out a blog post? Is it um, a downloadable like PDF? Uh, first of all, it all starts is I'm usually laying in bed my wife snoring and it like a recipe comes to my head and I have a little recipe book next is to my, is that your muse? It is. It's like, <laughs> I look, I'm like, Oh, she's so beautiful and she's so loud. And I know she's not gonna listen to this. So I can say that. And and then I'll, I'll start writing down recipes, and then in the morning I'll wake up and I'm like, man, that was that recipe looks good. And then that starts the whole idea of like actually marrying the flavors. And I think for me it's all about like a picture. It's a simple, beautiful picture because I can do. I mean, I write blog posts, people read it, and they share it and they have fun. But on Instagram, you see a beautiful picture, and it sparks something, and it's it becomes an art piece. It becomes you can automatically taste it. You know how many times I've, you know, people are like, I just drooled on my phone. I get that all the time. I just drooled on my phone. You're sparking something within their mind with the visual aspect 
of a deer steak and they can smell it. They can think back to when they hunted a deer. They can think back. They can. I mean, I had one guy say, I can smell the gunpowder from my rifle when I look at your picture. Like your brain is telling you what it wants to see when you see that picture. And so for me, it's developing the recipe and then taking just the most beautiful artistic picture I can to say, and I want you to see every flavor. If you look at my food, you can see every flavor. Like you can see the crust on the on the steak itself. You can see the pepper in the gravy. You can see the fire roasted on the jalapenos. You can see the crisp of the bacon. And your mind is telling you, I mean, we eat with all of our senses. And as hunters, we're the only ones that actually eat with our touch. Like from the moment we either knock an arrow or load a bullet, our touch is already activated within our our food. And so that in a sense itself is the coolest thing is we see it, we smell it, we, you know, we hear the gunshot, we hear the knife, we hear the fascia pulling off, we hear it sizzling in the cast iron skillet. And then we, you know, all that ends up into like the party on the tongue where it's like all those memories of the hunt are in a single bite. And I think that's the coolest thing is I try to tell that story in a single picture and then I'll write a post and I'll do a video. But I think first, if you don't grab their attention with just a beautiful, this is what I made, then it's, I mean, it's not going to, it's not going to do it. So is that vision kind of there from the get go? Like you kind of think about that recipe and then envision what it would look I usually like see it, fill the gaps? I, I usually see it first and then figure out how I can make it taste that way. Uh, like I did a deconstructed venison popper cause I'm so sick of people just making venison poppers and I thought about it in my head and I was like, how can I do that? And I had this picture of the steak with the, you know, with the smoked paprika, cream cheese, gravy, and the fire roasted, you know, jalapenos and the bacon. And it was a meal, not an appetizer. And then I sat there and I, you know, drew it out and doodled it out. And then I usually draw little lines. I'm like, this is what it tastes like. This is how long it's going to cook. And I've got this sketchbook of food. And then it, then I, then I cook it. And if it's good, I write down the recipe. If it's not, I tweak out what I can do, but I never write a recipe until I take a picture. And I think that's where I'm a little bit different than a lot of people. Oh, so that's your process. You're like, it can't just taste good. It's got to visually be good. And then you're like, now it makes the cut to get it. Yeah, I mean, into. I mean, even when you go to like, what a burger McDonald's, like you look at a burger and you're like, that looks good. And it comes out. You're like, that looks nothing like the picture. And so for me, it has to look good, taste good. And, and I think first of all, if it looks good, it's going to, and you can make all those flavors marry well, then it's, it's just going to captivate it. I mean, I had, I made these Asian venison meatballs with like a spicy sriracha teriyaki sauce. Oh, I mean, sounds good. it just got pinned like a million times on Pinterest. It all sounds good, Logan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a mil- like a million people pinned a venison meatball recipe. Like, really, a million? A million. I just got an email. I just got an email from Pinterest well, saying, "Congratulations, you've had a million pins." That's on- awesome. So, so we've got a Pinterest uh, presence, but it's like, you know, eighty-five percent female. I'm super. That's awesome that you've. That, well, that's the thing a good is with platform for with you. with cooking, is it is a female driven, right? It is female driven, and so if I can again, women are very visual. They want to see it. Like they look in catalogs. Guys are like, I want that shirt. It sounds cool. Chicks are like, I want to see the shirt. I want to feel it. I want to touch it. And so Pinterest, I was, I, I I used to make fun of my wife. I'm like, oh yeah, you're gonna pin that. You're never gonna cook it. And then finally, I was like. Started, started seeing people started pinning my, I didn't even have a Pinterest. Mm-hmm. They started just pinning off my website. I was like, well, maybe I should start one. And it was just insane to see how many, you know, I think it's like, I think it's like 86% female that are pinning it and they're cooking it for their family because they're sick of eating overcooked, you know, deer steak seasoned with Montreal steak seasoning. And so they're like, well, if I, you're going to kill a deer, I'm going to cook it and I'm going to make it taste good. And I had a lot of, a lot of wives that started seeing my food that are now actually hunting. Because they're like, well, we love venison now, and we need more deer. So I'm going to get my license because now we can get four deer instead of two deer. And it's a cool, like one girl, she just texts me, and she goes, yeah, all the kids in my homeschool, you know, mom thing, or I'll call me the, like, like the hunting mom because now I go out and kill and hunt. And, you know, she was very anti that. And now she's out there, you know, she shot two does like last week. And she's out there and she's posting well, pictures. It is so interesting because there's something that happens mentally. Like when, when you killed that thing – you have a greater or you feel a greater responsibility for it and then it, it also just tastes better agreed well it's like if you plant a, if you plant a carrot you right. pluck a carrot out and eat a carrot versus a carrot in the grocery store 
you're always going to love that carrot you planted because you took the time. Yeah. And I, I explain that to vegans. I go, you take the time to grow your produce and it tastes so good. I take the time to go out and pursue my meat because it tastes better. It's cleaner. It's everything that you just told me about your, 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 you know, butternut squash is everything I feel towards that deer. Everything. It's just mine has eyeballs and yours has a stem, but it's the same feelings. It's the same emotions because food again is all about emotions. And so, I mean, everything has to die for us to live. I mean, that, that butternut squash has to die for you to cook it and you to live. So what's the, what's the difference if mine has a heartbeat and yours, you know, has seeds. Yeah. Did you ever use paper vegans? Cause no trees don't die. Yeah. They give up their lives. <laughs> what uh, do you have a cookbook? No, I, I try to keep most, I'm in the process of trying to write cookbooks, but I realized that like through Pinterest, why am I going to waste the time to have a cookbook that sits on your shelf? A lot of people buy cookbooks because it's beautiful and it sits on the shelf and collects dust. Yeah. So if I can, if I can make interactive recipes on my blog and do some downloadable eBooks and put them up on Pinterest. I think I'd rather, I'd rather not make money and get people excited to eat wild game than make a bunch of money just to have a book set on someone's shelf. So I think that's, I I had all these ideas for these amazing cookbooks and then the past like six months, I'm like, you know what? I like giving it out for free. Yeah. Well, I don't think people are using books anymore. I think they have their laptop right. in the kitchen as opposed I mean, to flipping through a book. My wife will sit oh, there absolutely. and be like, be like, hey, Alexa, tell me how to bake brownies. And it's like, well, first, crack three eggs. Like, yeah. She has a, her mom's brownie mix like in her little recipe Bo- thing. Boil she, down one quarter ounce right. of marijuana <laughs> with butter till it uh, turns into an oil. <laughs> then pour that into your brownie mix. <laughs> and, then, and then drink. Don't bake. <laughs> <coughs> but, um, no, dude, that's awesome, man. This is definitely one of my, I think, the most interesting guests we've had well, on. What's your favorite recipe? We, we went through your favorite meats. My favorite recipe is, gosh, man, that's like telling me to pick my favorite kid. Sorry. I have one, but don't tell my other kid okay, that I have a favorite kid. Okay, you can do top three. Top um, I think that deconstructed venison popper, just because it has all the flavors of an appetizer, but you're dipping into it and you're able to, like, actually take your meat and dip it into that cheese sauce and you're not just having... Because, again, if you're taking a popper, you're overcooking your inside meat to make sure your bacon's crispy. And so it ruins, again, you overcooking venison, it's going to taste like mm-hmm. boot leather and, and gamey, as we said. Um, smoked duck, a good a good smoked mallard is just, I think, to die for. Um, or my favorite is just a simple, you know, venison or elk steak in a cast iron skillet with a little bit of Worcester, soy, garlic, and rosemary. Like that, I could just bathe in that all day long and then um getting back to the bear i was curious as to how what's your preferred method for making that i think i mean i like doing i love doing like using the roast to make different stews and soups like i do a I do a red wine reduct like reduction down of a of a bear hind quarter and just shreds and i make like a kind of your authentic irish stew with your potatoes your leeks your carrots your celery and use all that roux that melted down when the bear cooked with all the fat and pour that over it. And it's just, you've got this bear that melts in your mouth. You've got this delicious reduced red wine sauce with, you know, the authenticness of just the root vegetables. And it's just, it's great. Uh, let me, meat. let me ask you this test though. This is, this will tell you if you know what you're doing. Turkey legs. Um, turkey legs. Uh, I like to do Oso Boco okay. out of turkey legs. Um, I what's make. A, I'm, I'm not. Oso buco? What's a oso buco? That's where you you pretty much fancy cut them in half, yeah. and so that way when it cooks down, so turkey legs. A lot of people don't like them because of the tendons that are in the turkey yeah. legs. There's a zillion, a zillion and one. I think yeah. is the correct count. <laughs> and when you slow cook them, what happens is all those tendons turn hard as a rock. They turn into harder than the bone itself, and so you can actually pull those tendons out because the just, meat's going to shrink, and you can just literally sit there and just pull them out, and you can just. And then you're left with just this pure, delicious, dark, dark meat with the bone, with the marrow, cooked in, again, like a red rind reducted sauce. Um, my family's favorite way is I'll throw like four or five turkey legs in and I'll make like a, like a turkey leg uh, barbacoa. So throwing in all like the, the chipotle peppers, the andouille sauce, um, jalapenos, and all that good, you know, tom- fresh tomatoes, and let that just simmer down and cook, you know, in a crock pot or a cast iron skillet. 
and tell it just melts away and then throw that on like fresh tortillas with you know some pico yeah. de gallo i like to do that but put it on a polenta oh better polenta oh dude Woo. so i mean it's it's great because i go to turkey camp and i usually get like 40 legs oh yeah because everyone just breasts it out like goose camp too i'm like anyone gonna take their goose legs no okay i fill up like four buckets full of goose and turkey legs and and i think it's it's cool because people are like oh you can't eat that and i was like watch me um and grinding it up too like i ground up i did a i did a um i took a turkey thigh because a lot of people don't eat turkey thighs either and i pounded it out flat this year and i breaded it and made like a teriyaki um like burger like a crispy chicken burger but with teriyaki and like it was just absolutely insane to sit there and eat this thigh that everyone throws away. But legs, I mean, legs are almost, I think, better than breasts, in my opinion. I agree. I do. If they're done right, in my opinion, and, and it's not many people, most people, I don't know many people that even mess with the legs. No, because they tell you it's too tendony and it's yeah. not worth the effort and it's, yeah. Yeah, and they also, they think about, like, turkey legs from the from the carnival or the fair, the big, huge, massive Right, you go to, go to Disneyland, spend 20 bucks and get a leg that's the size of your arm. Right, right? whereas, a, you know, a... a a wild turkey leg, I would say, diameter is smaller than a tennis ball. Yeah, it's like a it's like a elongated chicken leg, is what I tell yeah. everybody. Yeah, yeah, I love it. It's delicious. So I guess I know my stuff. I'm super hungry now. Yeah, and so yeah. am I. <laughs> well, uh, we're at uh, 48. I think oh, it's, yeah. We're That's about good. good. Um, Jeremiah, where uh, where else? Besides Pinterest on Field of Plate, <laughs> where can we where can we find you at? Uh, yeah, so I've got from Field of Plate on Facebook. I like to post a lot of videos up there. I know a lot of old people still like Facebook. Uh, Instagram from, from Field to Plate, go go ahead and follow there. Um, I'm doing a lot of recipes for Black Rifle coming up, which is kind of a fun. That gravy looks so good. Dude, it was, it was pretty good. It was, I'm not going to lie. And I, I make those once the kids and wife go to work and school. So it's just me eating them. I don't have to worry about, like, fighting people off to get ham steaks. And then uh, Twitter from Field with the number two plate because Twitter likes to say my name's too long. And then uh, YouTube, I'm working on a whole YouTube series. Actually, on this class that we're teaching in Texas, I'm going to be doing um, breaking down a whole deer and doing it into, like, 90-second segments. Oh. So you can actually, like, watch a leg be broken down in 90 seconds. Each individual part is 90 seconds. So simple, easy, you know, precise. Hey, I already know how to knock out a back leg, but shoulders scare me. Watch the four videos that are each 90 seconds long and learn how to break down a front shoulder. So that'll be up in YouTube in the next couple months. Yeah, because most people just take their front shoulders and turn it into burger. Right, but you've got two beautiful steaks on right. the, on each side of the scapula that are just, I mean, more tender than the inner, the inner tenderloin if cooked properly. Right. Well, there you have it, Logan. Well, thank you so much, Jeremiah. No, thanks for having me. It was a good break in between the eight-hour drive. That's a long one. Thanks, Jeremiah. Glad you stopped by. Thanks a lot, guys.